On this Monday night, tough questions for London, Ontario police. The push for answers about why it took so long to lay charges in the Hockey Canada sex assault case. And I'm apologizing to the victim. As Sheldon Kennedy sees progress in how allegations are handled. We expect the truth and transparency. Cancer diagnosis, King Charles starts treatment and withdraws from public duties. A tale of two storms on two coasts, the big dig in Atlantic Canada. The front door is blocked. In the back, there's seven feet of snow. And the super soaker in California. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The case of the five former junior hockey players charged with sexual assault is moving ahead. And police in London, Ontario, where the alleged assault took place in 2018, are now answering questions for the first time since charges were laid. The players, four of them now with the NHL, did not appear in court today. Their lawyers represented them via video link. They all intend to plead not guilty. And the chief of the London police force apologized to the victim today, saying he he is not happy charges have taken so long. I'm apologizing to the victim and to her family because it's taken this long. This should not take this long. Here is the timeline. Police say the alleged assault took place in June 2018 in London. In February 2019, police closed their investigation. It was reopened in July 2022. Charges were laid on January 31st, 2024. That's almost six years after the incident was first reported to police. The woman at the center of this is known only as EM. And today the police referred to her as the victim, saying they consulted her and she does not want to be described as a complainant or a survivor. Eric Sorensen is outside the courthouse in London, Ontario tonight. Eric, one thing that's still unclear is exactly why London police reopened the case. Well, uh, Donna, police say that more evidence came to light in 2022, though they wouldn't say what it is, but they are admitting, as you pointed out, that the investigation took too long. And what became clear today is that the entire legal process is going to be a long one, and it's really just getting underway. London's Ontario... Well, uh, Donna, police say that more evidence came to light in 2022, though they wouldn't say what it is, but they are admitting, as you pointed out, that the investigation took too long. And what became clear today is that the entire legal process is going to be a long one, and it's really just getting underway. London's Ontario Court of Justice drew global attention Monday. Only the lawyers appeared in court by video link for five professional hockey players charged with sexual assault, including four NHLers. They were told by the Crown to expect substantial evidence in the case. The players were only recently charged, even though a woman told police she was assaulted in this London hotel in 2018 after a Hockey Canada event celebrating the World Junior Hockey Team that the five accused played for. London police dropped their initial investigation in 2019. Now, in front of an enormous media contingent, they were asked why the case was closed and reopened three years later. You know, again, I can't speak to that. Police Chief Tai Trung said repeatedly he can't speak about their own internal review while the case is before the courts, but he implied there were shortcomings in an investigation that, for the sake of the alleged victim, took too long. I want to extend, on behalf of the London Police Service, my sincerest apology to the victim, to her family, for the amount of time that it has taken to reach this point. The chief acknowledged the London force has work to do to reassure victims of sexual assault. Strengthening building community trust is a big priority for us. And we're gonna to work towards building the trust and repair, repairing some relationships. This law professor was more blunt. It seems that there were systemic failures in how the investigation was done, which seemed to be cursory and inadequate. Other critics say institutions from the police to the NHL reflect a culture in this country that for too long has not held abusive behavior accountable. It's been a culture of silencing and enabling of this very masculine culture that often is dehumanizing to others, particularly to women. However long the police investigation has lasted, expect the court case to be every bit as long and difficult if it goes to trial. It's going to be very tough for the victim. It's going to be very tough for the witnesses and dealing with five defense lawyers. It's going to be a lengthy, lengthy trial and we'll see what the outcome is. 
Lawyers for the five players say they will plead not guilty, so there is every reason to believe that a trial will take place in this case and that it will be a long one. The next court appearance for the five accused will be April 30th, just as the first round of the playoffs are underway. Donna? Eric Sorensen in London, Ontario tonight. Thanks. A little later, I'll speak with former NHL player and co-founder of the Respect Group, Sheldon Kennedy, on whether he thinks hockey culture has changed. The sexual assault trial of the Canadian military's former head of human resources heard testimony today from the woman making the allegations. This case dates back to 1991 when the woman says now retired Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson raped her while on board a Navy ship. He was a high-ranking officer, she testified, saying she froze and kept quiet during the alleged attack, fearing for her life. What would have been the consequence of me yelling, me pushing, me saying no, me not following orders, she told the Ottawa court. Edmondson has denied any wrongdoing and pleaded not guilty to one count of indecent acts and one count of sexual assault. There is more upheaval in the royal family. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. Buckingham Palace says it was discovered while the king was being treated for an enlarged prostate, but that it is not prostate cancer. He's already begun treatment and has stopped his public duties. Crystal Gamansing on what more we know. Shock and concern as the royal family divulged the king's cancer diagnosis. I mean, hopefully he does well. Um, this Canadian family in disbelief over the revelation. I know my parents are pretty, uh, my mom especially, is, is pretty uh, shaken by the news. She's always followed the monarchy. His Majesty started treatment Monday. The cancer was found as the king was receiving treatment for an enlarged prostate. Buckingham Palace has not identified what type of cancer the king has. Our thoughts are, of course, with His Majesty and his family and with all wish to send him our very best wishes. From the British House of Commons to the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau also wished the King well and a speedy recovery. British media outlets report Prince Harry will travel from the U.S. to visit his father. King Charles, according to the palace statement, remains wholly positive about his treatment. The 75-year-old ascended to the throne in September 2022 and in sharing the news hopes it may assist public understanding for all of those around the world who are affected by cancer. In the statement from Buckingham Palace, it says the king will continue with state business and official paperwork and looks forward to returning to full public duty as soon as possible. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamansing in London, thanks. Days after announcing an exclusive deal with Loblaw, Manulife is now backtracking. Canadians will be able to fill specialty drug prescriptions at any pharmacy. The insurance giant reversed course after a backlash from customers. Manulife had told people about 260 medications would only be covered at Shoppers Drug Mart and other Loblaw-owned pharmacies. That included drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease and cancer. Manulife says patients covered under the program represent less than 1% of all those insured through its company. Dangerous blizzard-like winter conditions brought much of Nova Scotia to a halt over the weekend. A lot of people are calling this Snowmageddon 2024. Since Friday, as much as 150 centimeters of snow has fallen on parts of that province. There's so much so fast that windows and doors were blocked. These people had to shovel their windows to get out of their homes. The storm has left thousands in the dark, shut down schools, triggered a local state of emergency in Cape Breton. Heidi Petrachik on the efforts to dig out and clean up. All right, let's take a look, see what's going on up here. A wall of snow greeted Glenn Gould when he opened his door in Sydney Mines Sunday. The snow just kept coming and coming and coming and it was like, Two, three days of, of nonstop snow. The front door is blocked, the windows. Glace Bay resident Pam Leader's home is barely visible in this photo as snow from her roof slid off. I don't know how many people at this point can't get out of their doors or windows. This time lapse shows just how the snow piled up, knocking out power to thousands throughout the province and creating dangerous conditions. I even heard about a vehicle that was abandoned, left on the road, covered in snow, and the plow hit it. So it was becoming a real hazard. So the Cape Breton Regional Municipality declared a local state of emergency Sunday and asked the Nova Scotia government for extra plow power. 
the province is moving equipment from other parts of the province uh, to the areas that are in most of need. And Ottawa is now putting up resources too. The Parks Canada equipment that it all is actually, uh, I was told, not too far away already. I'm in Dartmouth right now where Environment Canada's weather summary states anywhere from 33 to 52 centimeters of snow fell, creating drifts like this. So imagine then what it's like in Sydney, Cape Breton, where a volunteer weather observer recorded 150 centimeters. I just hope that uh, everybody out there got the help that they needed and uh, that uh, everybody is okay. People throughout the region are now focused on digging out. Many schools will remain closed. The historic cleanup underway. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. Parts of California are getting drenched right now. Satellite imagery shows a massive storm system stalled over the southern part of that state. It's called an atmospheric river, and it is the second in two weeks. About 38 million people are under flood alerts tonight. Jackson Prosco reports on how Californians are coping. This is already a storm for the history books, dumping nearly six months' worth of rain on Los Angeles in just a few days bringing the first ever hurricane force wind warnings to parts of the California coast. There was very high wind on the bridge. In the Hollywood Hills, there's incredible damage from mudslides as this powerful atmospheric river delivers more moisture than the ground can handle. Evacuation orders were issued for areas most at risk of flooding. It's extremely traumatic uh, to leave your house and not know what condition it's going to be when you get back. Near San Jose, the water rose so fast, people and their dogs had to be rescued. While down trees and power lines have left hundreds of thousands in the dark. I think the tree and the weather just didn't have a good mix. Scientists say El Nino and a changing climate have supercharged weather systems. This is very rare and unusual and a strong signal of a very high risk of significant flash flooding. And with more rain in the forecast, officials warn of a potentially life-threatening situation for the next several days. An unrelenting deluge California won't soon forget. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Two days of mourning are underway in Chile after at least 122 people were killed by wildfires on that country's central coast. Conditions were safe enough for some residents to return to some neighborhoods today to search through the debris. About 1,400 homes have been damaged. Rescue services are struggling to get to other areas and more than 300 people are still believed to be missing. A plea for aid coming up, what Canada is intending to destroy that Ukraine would like in its arsenal. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has said an overhaul of that country's military and civilian leadership is needed to reboot the war effort against Russia, hinting a major shakeup of his government is imminent and it could include replacing Ukraine's top military commander. All this is happening at a precarious time. Ukraine relies on Western allies to supply it with weapons and ammunition, and it has never had enough. The Netherlands says it is preparing to send more American-made F-16 fighter jets. U.S. senators have unveiled a $60 billion aid package for Ukraine, but that's being stalled by hardline Republicans. Now, as Jeff Semple reports, Ukraine's top military intelligence officer is urging Canada to donate decommissioned rockets that are slated for disposal. The frozen front lines in eastern Ukraine. <laughs> Nearly two years since Russia's full-scale invasion, Ukraine is running desperately short of weapons, and Kyiv is now hoping Canada can provide a lifeline. We are grateful Canada has been assisting, but we need more, says Lieutenant General Kirilla Budinov. In an exclusive interview, Ukraine's spy chief told Global News they've asked Ottawa for a donation. Securely stored inside a warehouse at this military depot near Saskatoon are more than 80,000 rockets. Known as Canadian Rocket Vehicle, or CRV, 7s. They were developed in Winnipeg during the Cold War, used to arm Canadian and NATO warplanes. But our Air Force no longer needs them. The rockets were retired two decades ago and are now slated to be destroyed. Ukraine wants to give these Cold War relics new purpose. It's thousands of uh, enemy tanks that can be destroyed. 
This Ukrainian Special Forces member and weapons expert, whose identity we're concealing, says they've developed ground launchers capable of firing the CRV-7s. He and his team have offered to travel to Saskatchewan to inspect the rockets and handle the transport. What's the general situation in Ukraine? It's hard to find bullets in shops, Jeff. We're asking for something that you don't need, something that you will never use. But several months since making the request, they're still waiting for an answer. The federal government has signed a contract with a company to safely dispose of the rockets. And Canadian officials also cited safety concerns. In a statement, the defense minister said we are pursuing testing to ensure that this equipment is operationally effective and safe to transport to Ukraine before any potential donation. Several weapons experts told Global News that if stored properly, the CRV-7s should be functional. Canada, you're in peacetime. You don't get to tell Ukraine what is or isn't a good risk. This Canadian advisor to Ukraine's military says if some of the rockets no longer work, the Ukrainians can still make use of the parts. We need a lot of equipment, the general says. In this case, Canada can save taxpayers money by transferring this equipment to us. We hope it will be a win-win. Each day, Canada mulls its decision, he says. More Ukrainians are dying. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, I speak with Sheldon Kennedy, who knows about abusive culture within hockey and is working to change it. And back to our top story now, the sexual assault charges against former junior hockey players. With me is Sheldon Kennedy. He is the co-founder of the Respect Group, which provides education and training to organizations and individuals on how to eliminate bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination. Sheldon, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Donna. Sheldon, I know you were able to listen to some of what the London police chief said today. He apologized to the victim for the length of time it's taken to lay charges, almost six years. The outcome we know, of course, will now be decided in court. But what does the way that this case has played out so far say to you about the handling of sexual assault cases generally? These are very difficult cases to uh, not only investigate, uh, but to also, um, you know, bring a conviction to. And, you know, it's absolutely paramount that we, uh, you know, come at this in a coordinated manner because the impact on the victim is real and we've learned so much about the impact. So, you know, look at this case that's playing out now going on almost six years, uh, Donna. I mean, it is going to have it take, take its toll on, on not just the victim, but the victim's family. And, and I think all of those involved. Well, I know since 2004, I believe it is, you've dedicated, been dedicated to instilling a culture of respect within hockey. You've trained thousands of people. You're working with the NHL and with Hockey Canada. Are we there yet? Unless we acknowledge, accept, and identify uh, the, the change needed and prioritize it within the organization, it uh, doesn't matter what we have going on within the organization, we're never going to be able to see the shift or the change or the, the, the growth that we all want to see. Because let's face it, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I've got, I've got young kids, Don, I've got a, I have a five-year-old son and I've got a, a one-and-a-half-year-old. And I know, you know, one of my, we were sitting at supper table the other night and, and I was off to do an interview and, and my, my five-year-old asked me, he says, where are you going, Dad? And I said, oh, I'm going to go do an interview. And he said, on what? And I needed this, and it caught me, caught, caught me off guard. And, wow. and I, and I, I took, the, took a minute to explain that. So I feel that a lot of families and parents are probably finding themselves in that situation. And I think it's a time for us as uh, parents and, and, and as adults to understand, to learn better, and to be able to try to have that conversation with our kids because it's, it, it provides a, a, uh, you know, a time to do that. You know, that's so important. Um, I have a 19-year-old son, and we've had conversations about this, too. It, it is so important that it sort of starts there. Uh, Sheldon, a situ if a situation were to emerge uh, like this today with these kind of allegations of abuse against junior hockey players, how confident are you that things would be handled differently? I'm confident, Don. I think that, uh, I think that there's been... Uh you know, uh, lessons learned, uh, lessons learned the hard way. 
Um, but I am also confident that uh, um, there's been an understanding that, uh, um, you know, the way we've always done or the way that, you know, business was always done when these cases would arise of sweeping them on the carpet that make them go away uh, is absolutely uh, not the way that they have to be dealt with uh, or that they can be dealt with. And I, I feel confident that, uh, um, uh, you know, cases would not be handled uh, in, that, in that way again here. All right, Sheldon Kennedy, thank you. I appreciate your work and your insight tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Hi, Sir Canada. Are these bighorn sheep near Hinton, Alberta? We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye bye.